We wanted to welcome you to this discussion. For many campaigners that are working on trade and corporate power, in many ways, transnational corporations are like new empires. Capital can move freely around the world, while people could not. So part of the two campaigns that we have on migration is to emphasize the right to stay, to get rid of the hostile environment, and also to push for a global free movement. Imagine that Martin Luther Luther King never had a dream. Imagine that instead of thinking outside the narrow confines of his time and place, he'd resolved to work only within them. Imagine he had instead risen to the steps of the Lincoln Monument and announced a five-point plan that he thought he could both sell to the black community and win a majority for in both houses of Congress that would bring civil rights legislation that one step closer. But he did. He chose not to engage in the narrow confines of the here and now and instead address not what will be or could be, but what should be. And it's in that spirit and the tradition that I come here tonight. I'm fully aware that no nation is going to get rid of their borders tomorrow or even next year. It's the role, though, of the radical to ask what can we do today so that tomorrow we can do what we could not do today. The map of my utopian world has no borders. No border guards, no barbed wire, no passport control, no walls, no fences and no barriers. The world, I believe, would be a better place without them. I believe in the free movement of people. Borders exist by definition to separate one group of people from another. And the primary two issues then become which other that will be and on what basis we should be separated. As borders have become tougher for people, they've all but been lifted for capital. Money can travel the globe virtually without restriction in search of regulations that are weaker and labour that is cheaper. And when it does, it displaces people, sucking investment and resources from one place at the flick of a switch. But those who find that their lives turned upside down by the free movement of capital are often prevented from moving country and looking for work. People should have at least the same rights, or more, since humans are more valuable than money, as machines. It is a fact, rarely stated, but generally acknowledged and accepted, that the global poor should not be allowed to travel. Indeed, one of the more interesting and intriguing aspects of seeing Sajid Javid's life story held up as an uplifting example is the detail that his father came to the country with just one pound in his pocket in 1961. Were his own father to arrive now, Javid would not let him in. <laughs> Worse still, he's okay with that. <laughs> if we open the borders, we will compromise our security, goes the claim. Well, the overwhelming majority of people who've committed terrorist attacks here were either born here or were here legally. The source of our terror problem is not strong or lax borders, but a thoroughly misguided foreign policy in which we commit to acts of, ter of terror ourselves, as in Iraq, or profit from the weaponizing of others to do it, as in Yemen. This would also help with the issue of refugees. First of all, we don't take anything like our fair share, even compared with European countries, let alone the rest of the world. And that's particularly galling because a significant number of refugees are fleeing from wars that we created. States we have failed, regimes we subsidise and regions we have disabled. Much of the migration in the world at present is not voluntary, but forced by extreme poverty, natural disasters and wars. It would be a better world if people did not have to move to eat. Environmental policies, particularly on climate change, arms control and responsible foreign and trade policies would all assist in allowing many people to stay where they would rather be, at home. What happened with the Windrush generation, for example, was not a mistake. It was not a glitch in the system. It was the system. It was the entire point of the hostile environment policy. People were treated as illegal unless they could prove otherwise. At any moment, almost anyone, your boss, doctor, child's headmaster or landlord can become a border guard. Indeed, they may be legally obliged to do so. And on the basis of their judgment, you may be denied livelihood, family, home and health. 
Nation states are a relatively new concept. Migration is as old as humanity. Borders seek to regulate and restrict that basic human custom for the distinct purpose of excluding some and privileging others. Immigrants are not the problem. Borders are. Thank you. You've said before, and I would probably agree, um, that the Labour Party has been weak in its defence of immigration and freedom of movement. In light of everything that you've just said to us, do you think there is a possibility of transforming the political party's approach to this issue? There is a disappointment, I think, at times with <coughs> this particular Labour administration because we know that they know better. It's um, been 70 years between two kind of monumental events, Windrush and the creation of the NHS. And those two things are intimately connected. Mm -hmm. That we could not have the NHS, which is more popular than the Queen, <laughs> without immigrants. That's a story that Labour can tell, because they created the NHS. What was so fascinating about Windrush, suddenly there was a conversation about immigrants as people who contribute who have families, who set down roots, who made Britain better. Was there not also an element of a rather sort of paternalistic, almost at times patronising, you know, it's kind of great. Yes, there are Just Jasmine is a nurse. The way that it was framed was very problematic. It was, these are good immigrants. Mm -hmm. We didn't mean to exclude them. We meant to exclude them. Mm -hmm. But actually, that was a step forward from, there are no good immigrants. Some of those in the Windrush generation weren't model citizens. And there's still this issue that Sajid Javid says, well, if you've committed a serious crime, you can't come back. As though the punishment for a citizen committing a crime in Britain is banishment. When you're engaging with British political party leaders, as I guess you do, and they certainly must read you, how are they responding to the charge of cowardice, which is more or less the summary of your position? I imagine that they think, bless. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy can go out in the middle of an election after there's been a bombing and say we have to, while we mourn the victims, we have to talk about Iraq. Mm -hmm. And we, we have to talk about the things that we are doing that contribute to this situation while making clear that the people who did this are responsible for that. Then I think, so you can do it. The other side can always undermine you with this. You can never outbid them on racism. You can't win that. And what we've seen is what happens when it doesn't work. That a bunch of people who frankly, I think, couldn't give a crap about immigration and find it all very tiresome and immigrants all very boring, now they can't, you know, holiday in France and they're upset. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, well, you know what? These barricades have been around for a while. Come join, come join us. There seems to be two choices. One is we say, well, you never bloody cared before. Mm. You blue flag waving folk who are marching. <laughs> or, great, you're now getting it. How do we make common cause? Because now this is part of this opportunity now. Draw those links. There's another few demonstrations you might want to go on. Yeah. You know, and here are some people, here are some bits of the paper that you weren't reading before that you might want to read because they really do affect you. People who are perishing in the Mediterranean, they're not you, but there is a connection between them and you. And if you want to keep the stuff that you have, if you want to keep the life that you have, or, uh, or some version of it, then those are going to be the people you're going to have to do it with. You didn't see them before, they were invisible to you before, or they are an encumbrance. Well now, they are your best hope. Your best hope of winning is to make common cause with them. Because you've only just got hungry. You've only just got mad. You've found something to get pissed off about and really angry about. Well, these people have been fighting for their lives for years. I'm frequently at meetings when 99% of the people talk about these things look like me. How do we change that? I interviewed Angela Davis once, and she talked about a model of kind of neoliberal diversity. 
and it's a difference that brings no difference and a change that brings no change. Yeah. And so what we, and what we need are anti-racist organisations. And I think if you build them, then the non-white people will come. In these last four years, Brexit and Trump, there's been a realisation that we are not as far ahead as we thought we were. Yeah. That um, a lot of people shut up. They didn't change their mind. The notion that you could be black and British was a contradiction in a lot of people's minds. Mm -hmm. And I felt that over the years that had been resolved. It wasn't as resolved as I thought it was. My family came from East Africa and we were hated. You know, we were, you know, people pissing in bots and smashing it out of windows kind of thing. And um, I remember having this discussion where people say, you know, I'd rather know rather than it being hidden under a PC blanket, I'd rather know. But I did notice with all the anti-racist festivals in Ken Livingston particularly that there was a massive change in my area and that people changed towards me. I think it spat in the face, you know, it really did change things. So I think that having that does have an effect, but I think this kind of racism that we see now is grown and it's developed. And I think that while the, the threads of it might have been there before, it's been emboldened and strengthened. I do think that you know, it's different from what it was before in some respects. I agree, we're in a, we're, we're in a different place. The anti-racist work um, that was done was valuable. <coughs> and actually one of the weak spots for the work that was done was how little of it actually involved immigration. The work that wasn't done is about our place in the world, how we got here. What put the great in Great Britain, exactly? You know, people will say, um, we won the World Cup, even if they didn't play. And they'll say, we won the war, even if they didn't fight. But you can't find anyone who enslaved anybody. <laughs> I, I actually do think there are rational reasons why people yeah. might vote to leave. I did not vote to leave, I voted to remain. The proper response to leave isn't really remain, it's transform. Yeah, and that absolutely. in the absence of a transformative conversation, what you have is staying <coughs> quite undemocratic, kind of somewhat neoliberal institution, which I did think was better than what we, what we may be about to do, but a much more difficult case to make. There is actually, you know, funders and prominent figures and kind of racist or anti-immigrant um, movements who very much work across borders. So I'm just wondering about whether you see, well obviously maybe it's to ask a bit more explicitly about that, but also maybe more positively whether you see a global counter movement to that as well. There is this international network of the right. And there is an international fight back of the left, but I don't feel that it says networked. Our enemies did start with a world view that was very unlikely. The notion of Trump being president, of Britain being outside the European Union, of of um, you know of the the, um, the Australian Conservatives getting back in, that Boris Boris <laughs> could be prime minister. These are crazy things that nobody thought were possible, and they become possible. So maybe we should think more about the impossible things yeah, that we yeah, want. Yeah. Starting from a utopian point of saying, well, this is where I think we should go, actually has the benefit, I think, of them just thinking about the world in a transformative way. Now, they have a dystopia. They have one with barbed wire and walls and guards and snipers and I mean, children in cages, they have one. They have a world view of what we should be like. And we're still coming up with a five point plan on the different steps. <laughs> it would be much better for us to have a world view. Look, this is the world we want. Now let's talk about how we get from here to there. One of the problems with Martin Luther King was, to some extent when he died, the movement died with him. Every now and then I see one. The guy who threw the milkshake. <laughs> I have faith in the decency of people. 
and, um, and and so I think, corny as it sounds, there are hundreds and thousands of Martin Luther Kings out there. Yeah, it's brilliant.